Hello, finance. Uh, we're picking up in chapter 11. Chapter 11, page 236, section 4, The Best Practices of Successful People, video 4.1. You know, I realized towards the end of the last video, I, I got really draggy and monotone. I think I was getting tired. Um, so I'll try to kick it up a notch for this video. Let's go ahead and get started. I, and I'm, I think I might be able to record this entire chapter in one day. All right. I got, got a little bit more free time than usual. So I'm going to give it a shot. So best practices of successful people, 4.1. Whoa, that is uh, definitely a different music. I'm, I'm going to let you guys hear this. No, no, you gotta get the full effect. Let's take it back to the beginning. Hear what I heard. Very odd tonal shift in the intro music there. This is uh, weird and not as happy and upbeat as the normal. Sometimes people think that if I just got a degree, everything would be okay. If I just had that skill set, I'd be okay. Don't get confused with that either. There's a great book out called EQ, Emotional Quotient, as opposed to IQ. It's juxtaposed to that, in other words. And what they found in the studies they did for that book was that in, in the formula that creates success, only 15% of what creates success is formal training in academics. 85% of what creates success is passion, perseverance, character traits and attributes, integrity, things like that are what cause people to win long term. It's not the next degree. It's not, I just, if I just had that class, I would be over the top. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Then you need to get the class and you need to get the knowledge and grow. There's nothing wrong with academics. Learn, 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 learn. But quick thinking, if I just gather up another degree, then I'll be successful. Success is more about other things than it is about just gathering up degrees in academics. I hope you never stop learning. Okay. Quite Long down, after this Quite class, down, I hope you're Hold still on. engaged with the world. I need to talk world. about something David just said. Okay. So if you're watching this video, I'm assuming you've been through at least one of my math classes. Which means that you've heard me do different creed discussions on dead mathematicians, or, or like I like to call them my, my wall of dead nerds, right? And I talk a lot about math history. Uh, and we kind of track the progression of math through the ages, learn about different things that Euclid did, things that um, Rene Descartes did, Newton and Leibniz. Uh, we even talk about uh, Fibonacci, also known as Leonardo de Bergoglio, uh, Muhammad al-Khwarizmi, right? Uh, nickname Al-Jabber from Algebra. And we cover a lot of math history in my math, math course. At no time was, while I was in college did anyone teach me any of that. I never learned any of that math history while I was in any class ever. I learned it by reading it and seeking it out on my own because I like math and I like teaching and I like history. I wanted to put that in my math classes, so I did. I sought out the history. I read up on it. I learned it. And I'm constantly adding to what I know about those guys. I'm constantly adding to what I know about math history. I'm constantly learning to make uh, the way that I present math even better. So that way I can give you a little bit of historical context to kind of perk your ears up and, and help you understand that there's a progression and there's been a very long story of mathematics. Uh, but I bring that up to, to kind of echo what he just said. You don't need a specific degree or a specific class to become that successful person. It's your habits and it's your behavior that make you become that successful person. I mean, we talked about this before with uh, mentors. If you want to be good at something, you should seek out people who are already good. You should seek out the knowledge and information on your own. Uh, and now we have the internet. The internet is an amazing resource. If you want to learn something, seek it out. All right, but then also use some discernment because not everything on the internet is true. We should know that by now. All right, go ahead, John. Around you and the people in your life. And one of the ways you can do that is by studying successful people through books or even just conversations. You can really learn a lot about how somebody else succeeded. You can find hurdles they jumped or holes they missed, and you can not do that in your own life too. And that's what I've done the last few years. That's one of the reasons I love working with the Dave Ramsey team. There's so many talented people here that I get to learn from. And over the years, what I've learned is that there's five things that successful people always do. 
And I wanna share those principles with you today. And as I share them, I'd love for you to write down an idea next to each one. What's one way that you can apply each of these principles to your life? So as I say them, think about your own life, in your own challenges, in your own opportunities. How do you do these things? Number one, they start. Successful people always start. They're a group full of starters. They don't get stuck. They don't wait. They don't let doubt creep in and and pause them and delay them. They start. They start a new project. They start a new goal. They start a new dream. They're constantly starting because they know that you can never finish something you haven't started. And so they're always starters. Number two, they fight fear. They have fear. Don't ever believe that you're the only one that has fear. Everyone has some degree of fear. Each new thing you try carries with it a degree of fear. But leaders, successful people, fight their fear. They admit it, they acknowledge it, and then they push through. They don't let regret and fear bog them down. That's the challenge about regret. It always wants you to give your present to your past so that you don't have a future. But if you wanna be successful, you've got to fight fear. Number three, they ignore haters. Granted, they take feedback, they take input, even input that might not be fun to receive. But at the end of the day, they know there's a big difference between input and hate. And they very deliberately put hate on the side. They move past hate because they realize that sometimes when you chase your dream, other people take it as a grand insult because it reminds them that they're not chasing their own dream and they take it personally. Number four, great leaders, successful people stay humble and hungry. That was a real surprise to me. When I joined Dave Ramsey's team, I got my dream job, if you will, and I thought, okay, dream jobs are kind of fun and easy and you run through a field with flowers and a ribbon and lavender, woo! That hasn't been the experience. I've gotten up at 4 a.m. more than I ever have in my life for early flights or video shoots, and I hustle harder. Why? Because you'll always work harder at something you love than something you like. And successful people work on the things they love. And they also stay humble along the way. They don't put themselves on a pedestal. They don't think they're all that. They don't think they've arrived because they know that ego will damage what they're trying to do. And number five, the last of all the things that successful people do, they give to others. They realize that in their life, they have things to give to others, their time, their resources, their expertise. They go out of their way to support their community. They start groups where they can give back to others. They mentor people. They find ways to give to the people in their life. So that's my hope for you and I. As we look at our lives, as we think about how do I be successful, what does it look like to do work that matters? Let's keep those in mind. And I hope you wrote them down and wrote a few ideas by each one. How can you start How can you fight fear? How can you ignore the haters in your life? How do you stay humble and hungry? And above all, how do you give to others? Over the years, I've been able to talk to a lot of men and women at all different income levels and at all different levels of wealth. I've met people making $150,000 a year who are flat broke and up to their eyeballs in debt. And I've met people making $50,000 a year who are debt-free, building wealth, and winning with money. How is that possible? How can it be that someone's winning at money, only making $50,000 a year, while someone else is losing big time while they're making $150,000 a year? The answer may surprise you. I think I've discovered one of the most powerful, life-changing traits of the super successful. I think this one thing is so fundamental that it's impossible to be financially successful without it. If you grasp this concept, you can have virtually anything you want. You can be whoever you want to be. You can do whatever you want to do. You'll be able to save and invest and give more than you ever thought possible. Your relationships will be richer. They'll be deeper. And this is really one of the most powerful financial principles that I can think of. But most people totally leave it out of their plan and out of their life. What am I talking about? I'm talking about contentment. People don't understand contentment, especially today. Some think contentment means apathy or laziness. The world is addicted to bigger and better. So the idea of actually slowing down and enjoying what you have with a sense of gratitude before moving on to the next big thing It's kind of a joke these days. When you're in high school, you feel like the whole world is open right in front of you, and it is. You feel like you can do anything and be anything, and you can. And you could go anywhere, and you could. All you have are options. That's great. 
but it can be pretty dangerous if you aren't careful. You could end up just pinning your happiness to different things out there in the future. You might say, I'll be happy when I graduate from high school. And then you graduate from high school. And then you say, I'll be happy when I get to college. And then you get to college. And you say, I'll be happy when I move out of my parents' house for good. And, and, and then you get there and you say, I'll be happy when I get a job and start making some money. And then you do. And then you say, I'll be happy when I meet that special lady or that perfect guy, get married and buy a house with 2.3 kids and a picket fence. Without contentment, your whole life will just be jumping from one thing to another, always hoping the next thing is going to be that thing that will make you happy. It's just not going to happen. Contentment is not a destination. It's not a place you get to. It's a manner of the traveling. It's how you do the journey. It's an attitude that influences everything you do with money. If you leave it out of your plan, you'll never feel like you have enough of anything. And trust me, that's no way to live. All right. Um, I, I really can't say that any better than Dave just did. Uh, so if you zoned out and you weren't listening to the last, like, three minutes, uh, well, um, go back and watch it, all right? Uh, just being content is not the same as uh, is, uh, having everything you need, all right? Uh, I, I think the best way to sum it up is how he said it at the end. Uh, contentment is not uh, where you're going. It's how you're getting there. So the way that you travel up the mountain of life, right? Um all right, let's keep going. As an author and a public speaker, I get to travel a lot. I spend a lot of time on airplanes, and sometimes I have really interesting conversations with the people I sit next to. I remember one flight. I was going from Dallas to Baltimore, and these two grandmothers sat next to me. They were probably in their 70s or maybe 80s. And during the flight, I gave the lady sitting next to me a copy of my book, Quitter. Now, I promise... I don't do that on every flight. I don't wear cargo pants full of my books and go, oh, it's in my pocket. I didn't even know that was there. I'll sign it, Wall Street Journal bestseller. Please, no flash photography. It drives my pores. But I gave her a copy of the book because we were talking about dreaming and working on your passions. And she started to read it, which for an author is an awkward experience because you kind of sit there and out of the corner of your eye start to look and go, is it changing her life right now? Are her teeth already brighter with my wisdom? Oh, she got out a highlighter. But after reading for about an hour, she leaned over and she asked me a question. And it was a question I wasn't expecting. It was a question I didn't have an answer to at the moment. And this is what she said. She said, hey, what do you do when all the excuses that you use to not chase your dream are gone? What do you do when you're out of excuses? What do you do then? And suddenly there was this profound sadness on that airplane because for the first time she was looking back on her life and realizing that life had passed her by. It had gone quickly. And I started to think, how do you and I not get to that moment? How do you and I not get to 80 or 90 and look back on our lives and realize we mortgaged them doing things we didn't feel called to do, things we didn't love doing for 60 years? How do we not get there? Because life moves quickly, doesn't it? I mean, if you're a senior in high school, you already feel that, right? I mean, high school went by fast, and college is going to go by even faster. How do you make sure you don't miss life? And so I started to explore that question. I started to research that question. I started studying successful lives and unsuccessful lives. And what I realized was really surprising. Having a successful life, having an awesome life, if you will, only involves five things. You have to go through five different lands on this road called life. And I didn't create those. I just labeled them. They've always been there. And the first land that you enter if you want to have an awesome life is called learning. And during this stage, you try a lot of different things. You don't know who you are yet or what you're all about. You have a bunch of different jobs and a bunch of different passions. You have a lot of different friendships. Maybe you even move cities if you're out of school and you change jobs and you learn and you're new, and you're an amateur, and it's okay. You try all these different things. The next step, the next season is called editing. You say, okay, I did these 100 things. These are the 10 that mattered most to me. These are the 10 I really want to explore, and you start to edit your life. You start to remove things that don't matter and focus on the things that do. In mastering the next step, you start to get really good at what you care about. 
You start to become an expert. You start to focus. As authors like Malcolm Gladwell have said, it takes 10,000 hours to become an expert. This is when you start to accumulate those hours and you get really good at that thing. And the next step, the fourth step, you go through a time of harvesting. All those decisions you've made start to come home. All those things you've planted start to come home. And in the fifth and last stage, you go through a period of guiding. You start to help other people down their own path. You start to reach back and pull people along in the same direction you went. Now, when you realize this, when you find that there's five lands, it becomes really easy to see how they work. I mean, for instance, the first three don't happen unless you make them happen. You won't learn, edit, and master by accident. Nobody wakes up one day and says, I'd never played chess, but all of a sudden... I'm a chess master. I, I can play chess like a pro. No, you have to be deliberate. But those last two stages will happen regardless of what you do. You will harvest and you will guide. You just might harvest things that people don't want to harvest. And instead of guiding and being somebody's mentor, you become a lighthouse indicating rocks you crashed your life on. You become what I call an anti-mentor, where people look at your life and think, I want to do the opposite. So that's what I love talking about is giving you a place on that map, helping you see, okay, I'm in learning and here's what I need to do. Or maybe you're in mastering, but those are the five stages. If you want to be awesome, if you want to get to the end of your life and sit on a plane next to an author and say, wow, the years were important. They mattered. I changed my life and I changed the world. These are the five steps you have to take. Okay, I know I give John a, a hard time in these videos, but that was a really good section. I, not a whole lot I disagree with there. Um, maybe the presentation could be a little bit better. I don't know. I, I guess I have a different style than he does. Uh, or uh, he's, maybe it's just the, the, the pitch, or the octave. I don't know the word. It's just the way his voice sounds. It makes me want to sleep. Uh, anyways, um, the main goal, how do you get to the end of your life without regret? Um, I, that's something that I think is highly linked to spirituality as well. Uh, your relationship with God and understanding that anything you get is actually a gift from him and being content with what God has given you and put into your lap. Uh, you know, for example, some people they have, they, you know, they always want, they want to go visit Europe, right? And it's like, Oh, my life just won't be complete until I go backpacking across Europe. Or there's some people that, Oh, I want to go to Hawaii. Uh, I can't have my dream, you know, but I won't be happy till I have my dream vacation in Hawaii. Um, and people will work towards different goals and stuff like that uh, all the time. This is really similar to what Dave said. Um, how do I say this? Um, hmm, maybe I'll pause for a second, gather my thoughts. Okay, got it. Because uh, I had to gather my thoughts because I wanted to say this in one sentence. The way you get to the end of your life and you look back at everything and you are content uh, with everything that you've done is you be content now, right? So start being content right now, okay? If you never get to go visit that, you know, the, the, the Hawaiian islands, are you going to be miserable because of it? Let's say, uh, what you know, you want to have a huge successful business. What if you never get there? Are you okay with that? Can you handle not getting what you want? Um, you know, pick anything in your life that you want or anything in your life that you already have. Will you still be okay if it gets taken away or if you never get it at all? Uh, if you can answer yes to that, then I think you're finally content. If not, figure out why you can't say yes to that. You know, mentally break down your reasoning, your thought processes. Reconcile those emotions with reality and figure out whether or not you actually could be okay with that. All right, that's all I've got for this video. Uh, yep, let's let's finish chapter four.